I'm Dr. Ken Edstrom, and I have had the privilege of being involved in the life and miracle of baby Leah Faith. And I hope her story and her inspiration can help guide your family through this time of trouble. Well, it pretty much started when I was pregnant with Raquel, and uh, upon nearly losing my life with her, um, and Leah came along, they decided to go ahead and do uh, four ultrasounds and a very intense care or intense study of her to make sure everything was okay. And on the fourth ultrasound, that's when they found her heart defect of a heart murmur. And from a heart murmur, they sent me into the cardiologist for an ultrasound. And when they did the ultrasound, they found that she only had half a heart. And the left side did not develop all the way. So then from there... Dr. Hedstrom called us in to his office to explain to us that neither one of us caused the problem and we shouldn't blame each other. And that this is what is coming at us and we need to walk in a way that we can have life and get through it. Maybe we can talk a little bit about what it means when your baby has hypoplastic left heart. You may have found this out as we found out with baby Leah on an ultrasound. An ultrasound is sound wave images that are generated during your pregnancy. Or you may have found out after your baby was born. Often in utero, because of the way that blood flows through the heart and lungs, the problem isn't that uh, critical. The critical time, however, comes with the transition changes that happen at birth. We delivered her. I was cesarean and they brought her out to, and Al got to walk her to the NICU. And from there they proceeded to hook her up. And basically they paralyze her and get her all her oxygen levels and all her blood regulated and um, balanced for surgery, and that takes days, it takes time. So then they left her there balancing her throughout the week, and they did a couple blood transfusions. And about the end of the week, they went ahead and did the first open heart surgery. You cannot hold the, hold the child, you can touch hands and feet and sing to them, but you cannot hold a child. They actually released us from Stanford to Mary Bridge Children's Hospital for the time because she wasn't well enough just to be left at home, but they would release us to another hospital. So then she went through that process, got in over the flight and into Mary Bridge. And that's when they discovered she had methamphetamine staff. Right. They, we go through a regimen of intravenous antibiotics and those, those antibiotics, are, um, she was doing twice, twice a day dosages, and they're $3,000 a pop. No, she was doing three times, I was doing them three times a day. Three times a day at 3000 for five months. Oh, that was the second round. Yeah, the second. That was the second round. We're going back to Stanford for the second open heart surgery. So well, she had to have a calf, and we were quarantined the entire time we were home. She had to be quarantined, I, she couldn't go out. So then we went in for her catheterization and that's when they found she had a blood clot in one of the veins of her heart. And she had massive veins going throughout her heart. Like a spider web. The veins had rerouted. Yeah. We were trying to find, the blood was trying to find its way back to the body. Well, what they told us at Mary Bridge is they could do the surgery, but if something went wrong, they couldn't save her. They said at Stanford, they have the equipment. They have the technology, they could save her. So we made the decision to send her to Stanford. That was the only call that could be made. At 10 o'clock, the team showed up. At 11 o'clock, they were in the air. And at midnight, they got to Stanford. And we were told that Jomi could go. She had to pack 35 pounds of, 35 pounds. That's her baggage, one bag. And that's all you're given, and go. So. Between 9 o'clock, we drove home, packed a bed, got back to the hospital, and medevaced out and down to So we were at Stanford for, I think, a month, month and a half, and then we came home. And when we came home, um, 
a friend of mine went down to help me get home. And on the way back, her chest was filling up with fluid and we didn't know it. So when we got home, she, let's see, she turned purple on me. She kept um, throwing up her milk. She couldn't keep her milk down. I was up for three days straight. I did not sleep. And I called the cardiologist and we ran in. I took her in there because normally you need an appointment. And I said, that's it. We're going in. So but Mothers, um, no. Mothers, no. So we went in and I dropped her off at the front desk and they screamed. They called uh, Code Blue. And they, her oxygen levels were at 35%. So then at that time, they rushed her in back in a Mary Bridge, and that's when they found her chest was filling up with fluid, and they had to get her drained. So after they got her drained, they discovered she had met the nurses staff again. So as we were coming back into Mary Bridge, um, the second time around, we were dealing with met the staff again. The seizures, which were under control of phenobarbital, and she was recovering from the chylothorax. And they were trying to get us all back together. So we, I sat in Stanford, or Mary Bridge, from March 11th until April, after Easter. We were released the week after Easter, in April. And then we came home and I was trained how to do intravenous antibiotics three times a day. You set it up in a sterile environment and bring it down in a sterile environment. It takes two hours to run. You have to keep it cold. And I did that for five months, and she came out with no infection, no consequences, and that. But during that time, I basically, she was on an NG tube also. She was on a feeding tube, so she had feeds every hour around the clock, 24 hours. So I was up basically taking catnaps through my life, trying to let Al go to work and trying to take care of her. And yeah. So I guess she was on an NG tube for uh, two, two and a half years. She had doctor's appointments all the time. Uh, she was on, started off on 13 medications and we have her down to four. And was it right after the second surgery? She, we went on a stroller walk right in the cul-de-sac and she, the buckle wasn't buckled all the way. She fell out she on her dive head out of the car. and her head was like, it was all she open and everything. And she fell out and she hit her head. And then we rushed, I remember we ran back here because it wasn't very far, it was just across the street. And then you called the doctors and then you went to the emergency room. She was fine, but she was on Coumadin, and Coumadin being a blood thinner, you have to take every precaution necessary. So we had to go in and just make sure everything was fine. And she turned out fine. We got rid of the stroller. <laughs> so, um, so then the, the next few years were, well, next, year and a half was basically maintaining and getting through, oh she had speech therapy, she had to learn how to eat, she had to recover from a stroke, so we had taught her sign language and then she was in physical therapy for two years recovering from the stroke that hurt, hit her motor skills on her right side that affected her left. So and then pretty much she graduated from um, physical therapy, I worked with her at home and then I worked with her really hard at home on feeding getting her to eat, and I think her first thing that she ever ate was cotton candy at the fair. Yep, so. <laughs> that is the kids have. That's right. And then from there, she, I just, the speech therapist taught us what to do at home, and we met once a week. And I worked with her at home until she started gaining weight. We could work her off the NG tube, and we've been able to keep her off the NG tube since last April. But we're, at, we're checked every three months. Go, 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 man. Yeah. You can do it. You can do it. Drink your milk, eat your food. So we, in this house, let's see, some of us are on a low-calorie diet. Some of us are on an extreme high-calorie diet. Lots of whipped cream, cream cheese, and sour cream and butter. <laughs> so. So we're headed for the third. Getting ready to go. And if she's not 30 pounds, they won't take her because Unless when a child is 30 pounds, all of their, when their heart pumps, all the blood goes, well, normal, a normal child, the blood flies through the body. For a hypoplastic left heart child, when the heart pumps, it drips the blood out like an IV. So all the backup pressure builds up throughout the body. And the child has to be big enough where the organs are strong enough to withhold all the pressure that's going to hold up around it, I mean, for forever. If her oxygen levels start decreasing, then they'll go ahead and do it. But right now we're just in the waiting game of keeping her stable and getting her to gain weight for that third surgery. In the meantime, I think we've learned how to teamwork and pull together as a family. And share the tasks. Share the tasks. 
It's hard for we me. We shared the medicines. <laughs> it was hard for yeah. me because I wanted a sister for so long and then I got a sister with a heart defect and it was like, is she going to live, you know? Right, so it was a lot of emotional stuff that was transpiring through the last three years. Three and a half? Three and a half years. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> And through it all, she's had the best attitude, she most has. joy. Smiles. No problem. And it's really kept us remembering. She's done it, done it well. She's bold. She's bold. <laughs> give me, give me. She's brave. That's really <laughs> helped us remember to have a really great attitude and you know that life is a gift. Mm -hmm. Each other is a gift. Yeah.